Love the British monarchy? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the To Die For Daily podcast with Kinsey Schofield. Take it away, Kinsey. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the To Die For Daily podcast. Um, Giles, how is it that you've become an, a, a Madonna type figure or a share where whenever I see you on television, it's just one name? Oh, that's very good. Thank you very much indeed. Well, there's a, probably a reason for that and that I am a bit of an enthusiast for Oscar Wilde, oh. the Victorian writer. And Oscar Wilde observed that most people in the world, if they want to be remembered, need to have a name with just five letters. And like, like Oscar or Wilde, or indeed he said Plato, or Jesus, or he said this, in fact, when he was visiting the Barnum and Bailey Circus and meeting Jumbo the Elephant for the first time. And he said Jumbo will be remembered by the name Jumbo in 100 years. Elvis. And, uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. D-I-A-N-A, -A, Diana. Oh, and, and, and so what his philosophy was that if people like you, they remember you by your first name. And if they don't like you, they remember you by your surname. Oh. So, yes, exactly. Putin. Um, I'm not wishing to be controversial, but some people call your former president Trump. Oh, yeah. um, whereas uh, the British prime minister, the last one, used to be known as Boris. Exactly. So it tends to be people that we are fond of, that we use by their first names. Oscar Wilde said 100 years from now, people will, my friends will call me Oscar and my enemies will call me Wilde. So I'm very happy to be known as Giles. But I'm here with you today because we are celebrating something that in many ways changed my life quite by chance. In the 1970s and 1980s on TV in Britain, I used to wear colorful knitwear, yes. sweaters. And I wore them because a, a big advertising man over here said to me one day, you know, uh, Giles, uh, people, when they're watching TV, they mostly remember what they see, not what they hear. Did he said to me, research suggests that 83% of what people recall is what they see, only 17% what they hear. So people are going to remember what you look like, except you don't look very interesting and you don't look very attractive. So that's your problem. And I thought, well, I'm going to solve this. So I began wearing colorful sweaters on TV and I became the sweater man, oh. 1970s. And I teamed up with a guy I had met called George Hoster, who was the head of design at a university in England. He taught design. He was also a sculptor and artist. And we created fun knitwear of different kinds. One of the first that we created and we had fun with was this sweater I'm going to show you now. Which oh, features I love that. Cockatoos. <laughs> I'm showing you this because this was a favorite of Diana, Princess of Wales. And that's why we're talking today. So we created these sweaters, he and I, and we sold some of them in a shop in London, just a boutique, one-off place where the sweaters were sold in Kensington Church Street, which is just around the corner from Kensington Palace. Oh. And one day, walking up Kensington Church Street, doing some window shopping, came Diana, Princess of Wales. And she peered into the window and saw the cockatoos. And she liked them. And she went in and she said, have you got any more like that? And they showed her uh, our little range. And it was quite a small range those days of what was available. And she bought a couple of the sweaters. And one of them, of course, is the one that you're wearing, that I am wearing today. I'm a luxury. Yes. And on the back, of course, it says, few can afford. And because she loved that, she had a great sense of humor. Um, and she loved it. She, she, she liked the look of our sweaters, but she particularly liked that one because I think she enjoyed the message. And because she was photographed wearing it uh, with her boys, William and Harry, um, the photograph became famous. As you know, she was uh, perhaps the most photographed person in the world in those days. Um, it became, it's become a very popular sweater with other people. But what I, what I love about the, the sweater is that it stood the test of time. And I think what's interesting about, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, Diana was very beautiful and she wore clothes extremely well. But when I look at a lot of 
the clothes that you wore. They have a a retro feel, um, you know, the shoulders, the, the evening clothes, particularly the, those big shoulders of the time, the sleeves. Really, yeah. It's all of that. Whereas the sweaters are the one thing that still look contemporary. Yeah. So you see a picture of her in, in any sweater, particularly our sweaters, uh, and you think this is a person who is of now, of 2022. And that, I think, is fantastic. It's fantastic uh, for us. And it's certainly, uh, I mean, I just love, I mean, it's, it, it's for, for us to have created this sweater, it's like being whoever it was who created, you know, the frock for uh, Marilyn Monroe, the one oh, yeah. where she stands, you know, or, it's blown or, up. Or Jackie O's pill hat. That's exactly yeah. what it feels like. And it, which is a fantastic thing. Oh, I know. Um, what a thrill. So, and you and you met her and she recognized that you made her her jumper, correct? I did, indeed. I met her at a party. I was a member of parliament. I later became a member of parliament. And this was in the 1990s. And I went to um, a party reception where she was the guest of honor. And I walked in and she said, you're not wearing one of your sweaters. She said, I, I, she said if I'd known you were going to be here, I'd have been wearing you. And I said, well, I'd have been wearing me too if I'd known. <laughs> Uh, but I have to say, one of the things I, I, I love about the sweater is that it celebrates the the happy side of her, the witty side of her. I mean, here we are, uh, 25 years after that tragic accident, uh, remembering her. And one of the, the downsides of dying young, and of course, many of the, the great immortal figures who have become iconic, whether it is Marilyn Monroe or James Dean, or Elvis Presley. These are people who often do die before their time. You mentioned uh, Jacqueline Onassis, of course, uh, married to John F. Kennedy. Um, the, the tragedy is then, they're then viewed through, through the eyes of the tragedy, through the prism of the tragedy. Right at the beginning of our conversation, I mentioned the great Victorian Irish playwright, Oscar Wilde. Well, movies have been made about his life, uh, but people view him through his downfall. He died when he was only in his 40s as well. So we see Diana often through the prism of her, of her death, mm. uh, her tragic death, and indeed through the unhappy aspects of her life. But what I love about being associated with the sweater that she loved is that it reflected um, the Diana that I knew, certainly when I met her, which was full of fun and wit and enjoyment and pleasure. And she took pleasure in clothes. She took pleasure in looking good. And what I love about the sweater is that it's a combination. You can you look good in it if you're being casual, but you can be very smart and chic in it as well. So that's that's the good news. I do get a lot of looks, um, positive looks, when I wear my pink one with a tutu. Everybody stops and tells me how cute it is. And I'm like, thank you. I, I, I've got a pink one, too, and I was tempted to wear it with my tutu. But I, I resisted that temptation. <gasps> Man, not just not just my luck. Uh, you, I, I, I read. I laughed out loud when I read online somewhere that you are retired because you have to be one of the hardest working people that I've ever met for being retired. Um, you've got a podcast. You're an author. I mean, uh, you've so many incredible anyway. books. Um, and one of them that I love is Philip, the Final Portrait, where you talk about Diana and Philip's relationship specifically how protective he they were both outsiders and he was very protective of diana especially in in the 80s i was very lucky to get to know the duke of edinburgh who was married as you know to her majesty the queen queen elizabeth ii for more than 70 years they married in 1947. Uh, he'd had a, a most extraordinary background his own story is remarkable um born in 1921 grandson of the king of Greece. That king was actually assassinated. His family driven into exile from Greece um, when he was a baby. His parents split up when he was only 10 years of age and he didn't see uh, he didn't see them for several years. He didn't see his mother, not a postcard, not a Christmas card, not a birthday card for several years. She had a, a mental breakdown, uh, ended up in an asylum in Switzerland. And he never complained about any of this, ever. And uh, he was a most resilient and remarkable human being. 
and uh, but he was a, a cousin of the queen. He was royal himself. Indeed, he was more royal than the queen because he was descended from royalty on both sides of his family. Oh. Uh, William II is royal on her father's side. Uh, she's a great great granddaughter of Queen Victoria, but on her mother's side, she is from an aristocratic family. In the case of the Duke of Edinburgh, he also was a great great grandson of Queen Victoria. But on both sides of his family, he was related to royalty. There isn't a king, a czar, a kaiser uh, that Prince Philip wasn't related to. So he understood the challenges of royalty. And I think he was very sympathetic to Diana. Obviously, like every father, he would have loved his uh, son's marriage to have worked. And I know it frustrated him that uh, in the years, in the 80s, when it wasn't working, and when all that became public, uh, that there were press. I don't know if on your side of the water it was like that, but here there were newspapers saying that, you know, he had been tough on her, he'd written her letters that made her cry. And this was the reverse of the truth. And I said to him once, you know, I, I happen to know that that is not so. And he said, yeah, well, these things happen. I mean, he was he was very reconciled to the way the press wrote about these things. I mean, he regretted it. One said, you know, the, the media have turned us into a soap opera. He didn't like that at all. Um, but he accepted that that's the way the world was. In, in point of fact, he wanted to be helpful. He was a pragmatist, not a romantic. He obviously, he once said that was the difference between him and Prince Charles, said, you know, Prince of Wales is a romantic, I'm a pragmatist. But that doesn't mean to say, you said this, doesn't mean to say you can't be loving as a pragmatist. And he was very much a practical person. And I think his idea, and he, he wrote several letters to Diana, really saying, you know, how can I help? What can we do? And I think he sat down with uh, them both saying, you know, actually work out what's working and what isn't working and try and do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. And so I think he and the Queen were both, obviously, that, that they would want to. And I think they did in practical ways try to be helpful. Um, but it wasn't to be. Um, I think his view of the world reflected his generation. It was the uh, Napoleon, the French emperor, military leader. Uh, and I know Duke of Edinburgh read several biographies of Napoleon. Napoleon once said, if you want to understand a person, you should remember what the world was like in the year that person turned 21. And the Duke of Edinburgh turned 21 in 1942. He, he was in the Second World War. He was in the British Royal Navy, mentioned in dispatches, had a heroic war. But he reflected that generation, what people talk about, the stiff upper lip. Mm. He didn't complain, he just got on with things. And I think if you want to understand people, you should remember that. He reflected his generation just as Diana reflected hers and just as William and Harry reflect theirs. And so not everybody will be the same or will have the same approach to problems. So I think he, he wanted to approach the problems facing her and his son in a way that felt he felt comfortable with. Um, and I know, for example, today, he, he wouldn't feel comfortable with, for example, somebody like um, Prince Harry uh, talking about or, or writing about um, his personal angst, simply because he didn't feel that's not what he would have done. His, his view of life was, you know, look up, look out, uh, get on with it, don't talk about yourself. That was one of his rules, don't talk about yourself. And he tried very hard to avoid talking about himself, which made, uh, for me, writing his biography pretty challenging. But he was happy for me to set the record straight on the matter of, of him and Diana, because far from being, as it were, unhelpful, he very much wanted to be helpful and loving. I think that's so important, especially when Americans specifically are watching The Crown and assuming that that is all factual, when in reality, it's a, it's a little, you yeah. know. Well, in fairness to the people who make The Crown, I think they don't claim it's factual. I think they, they claim it's a, uh, an entertainment, a drama based True. on real events. Um, True. I find I, I loved watching the early episodes before I got to know well, you know, before they got to the period that I really knew about, and yeah. then I, I didn't feel I could cope with it. Those are my friends. This is not. This is not true. That's well, interesting. Uh, these are people I know. I wouldn't yeah. presume to call them my friends. When I, many years ago, I met a former British Prime Minister called uh -huh. James Callaghan, 
And it was at a Buckingham Palace garden party. And he was the prime minister. And I said to him, well, you know, get this weekly meeting with the queen now, which the British prime minister does. Um, I said, you know, and it's rather exciting being friends with royalty. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, young man, you must remember this. Uh, royalty, they offer you friendliness, not friendship. Never forget the difference. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I did. In your book, you, you specifically did say that the Queen and Prince Philip ask you a lot of questions about yourself and try to sway if you ask questions about them. Do you think that they ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People? Or is that just protocol? I think that's just I, I think that reflects their generation. Okay. They were they are interested. I mean, the, one of the reasons I, I wrote a book called The Seven Secrets of Happiness. I love that book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, not only are you wearing my sweater, you're reading my books. You're my kind of person. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to listen to your podcast. And now you're listening to mine. I mean, it's this is anyway. Uh, <laughs> one of the ways of being happy is to be outward looking. Um, uh, Prince Philip was interested in psychology, particularly the work of Jung. And Jung, Carl Jung, Swiss psychoanalyst, he... Uh, came to the conclusion, having studied his patients over many years, that the people who were happiest were people who had an interest beyond themselves in life, who were interested in science or nature, music, the arts, the world around them. And uh, his experience was that introspection can be damaging. Um, so that was very much the Duke of Edinburgh's approach, and that is very much the Queen's approach. Uh, they, they're lucky, they're blessed, they've had passions in their life. The Queen, driven by duty, as we know, sustained by faith, faith is hugely important to her, but uh, kept happy by her passions. In her case, her passions are her dogs and her horses. Um, and so, and the Duke of Edinburgh also had a range of passions, things like his carriage driving uh, that he was, you know, completely uh, besotted with. So you need a passion in life to look up and look out and just don't talk about yourself. Exactly. And of course, once people know that's your rule, then they, they don't ask you questions, you know. Uh, and they were very good too at not giving answers. So, you know, if you ask them a question they don't feel inclined to answer, they don't say anything. It's a oh, wonderful discipline to have. Brilliant. Well, well, I find that quite difficult. I'm so lucky to get the opportunity to speak to you. I admire your work so much. And um, I was wondering, looking at all of the things you've accomplished, what are you most proud of? And I'm going to let you go after that. But I just, I just, when re I was reading your biography, everything you've accomplished, I, I just, what are you, and, and your beautiful children who are brilliant as well, mm -hmm. what are you going to leave this world with? What do you want people to remember you by? Well, look, look at this. The I'm a luxury. It's it's now on a um, a wallet. It? It's a wallet. That's what it's called. Uh, it's it's on a wallet, and I thought this is beyond belief uh, to have created something that people want to buy uh, and to keep. I, I think it's fantastic. So I don't know what I'm. I'm I mean, I'm. I, I hope I'm proudest of what comes next. I love whatever I'm doing at the time. Yes, and I have to say, I am very lucky to have met so many interesting people um but if you are what you wear and i think to an extent you are um then it's fantastic for me to have created with my friend george hostler this line of knitwear giles and george where people actually put on a sweater and feel better and i and i like a joke i like what i loved about diana and this is that she got the joke yes uh, and the luxury and then she turns around and she would spin around if you can afford, and that's witty. Uh, I don't know, I do know several of the sweaters that she bought, and uh, I do know that this one was her favorite, and I do know that the cockatoo she also loved. Uh, I have did do another one along the lines of what the blank, blank, blank is going on, and on the back it says, don't ask me. <laughs> I don't know if she acquired that, and it has recently occurred to me that at Kensington Palace, where she lived, they have a lot of her clothes. Occasionally they do exhibitions. Yeah. And I might be getting in touch with them to say, maybe some of the knitwear should go on show. Yes. And we can discover what else she had in her closet. 
Oh, I would love, I'd be first in line for that. Uh, I will tell you my favorite piece is this black jumper that has a huge heart because I just feel like it defines who I am. Um, but that's my favorite piece that I own. But I have this, the pink one, the black jumper with the heart on it. I love your clothing. Well, you're very kind. The, the, the heart is the second most favorite one in the world. So. I bet, I bet. Um, well, thank you so much for your time well, today. Look, you are a look, joy. You are a joy. And now what is your podcast called so that I can put it on my call up podcast so I can it's, get it? It's called To Die For Daily. To Die. And it's done daily. You do it every day. Um, it's about living every day with your heart on display like Princess Diana. So oh, that it just I love that. that. And that's oh, also why I love my heart sweater. <laughs> That is fantastic. Well, you tune in. I mean, I do a, a podcast yes. all about words and language called... Um, purple. Something rhymes with purple. <laughs> yeah. Something does rhyme with purple. Was it purple? Well done. You are well informed. <laughs> and also, since you're into royalty, you might like another podcast I've done called the Commonwealth Poetry Podcast. Oh. Uh, it's all about poetry around all the different countries of the Commonwealth. There are 56 of them. And our first episode was with um, Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall. Yes. The current, the present yes. wife of uh, Prince Charles, and who is a, a fascinating and lovely person. And fascinating and an by an avid reader. She loves books. She loves books. She's got her own uh, book club called the Duchess of Cornwall's Reading Room. But she did this podcast for me and my daughter, uh, the Commonwealth Poetry Podcast, talking all about her favorite poetry oh. um, and poetry is a wonderful way of wearing your heart on your sleeve yes um, sharing it let me end with a little poem please since, since now i understand what your podcast is all about spreading the love this is four lines by hilaire belloc from quiet homes and first beginning out to the undiscovered ends there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends that is so beautiful thank you so much for that well that's all we need that's we just need laughter and friendship and then we're sorted the right sweater of course helps as well <laughs> of course absolutely lovely indeed you've made a friend for life see you next time thank bye you, now sir. bye thank you for listening to the to die for daily podcast with kinsey schofield a transcript of this chat is available at to die for daily.com Please subscribe to hear more from your favorite royal commentators. Cheers.